The splitting of the atom will make it possible to create the deadliest weapon in human history, nuclear weapons. At the height of the Cold War confrontation, the nuclear warhead arsenals of the opposing sides, the USA and the USSR, numbered in the tens of thousands. It seemed that humanity was doomed, and nuclear weapons would be used again, just as they were, during the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But this time, the catastrophe would be global. On a worldwide scale, for which a special term was even coined, nuclear apocalypse. The atom would be perceived with hostility, because it seemed capable only of bringing death and destruction. But everything would change. On December 20th, 1951, when the atomic reactor at the US Department of Energy's National Laboratory generated enough power to light a series of four 100 watt bulbs. Later, the experimental reactor named IBR-1 would increase its output to 100 kilowatts. Thus would begin the history of the peaceful atom, which would be used to produce inexpensive electricity. The world's first nuclear power plant began operation on June 27, 1954, in the Soviet Union, in the city of Obninsk. Two years later, on October 17, 1956, the full-scale talk Calder Hall nuclear power station in the United Kingdom would start operating. The first nuclear power plant, dedicated exclusively to commercial electricity production, would be shipping port in Pennsylvania, USA. It would be connected to the power grid on December 18, 1957. Most nuclear power plant reactors were also used to produce plutonium, needed for the creation of nuclear warheads. Subsequently, the number of nuclear power plants in the world would grow like mushrooms after the rain. It seemed that peaceful nuclear energy would become an inexhaustible source of cheap electricity and would be completely safe for people and the environment. That was the case until this day. What's burning over there? An explosion at three. On the left unit, three, four. Three, four. Are there people there? Yes. A horrific man-made disaster that would occur on the night of April 26, 1986 at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. As a result of two explosions, the fourth power unit of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant would be completely destroyed. The blast wave would send deadly radioactive debris into the sky, which, carried by the wind, would contaminate everything around. The radioactive cloud will also cover the Belarusian lands adjacent to Chernobyl. An elevated level of radiation will be detected even in the Scandinavian countries. The higher party leadership will initially try to conceal the Chernobyl disaster, but upon realizing the scale of the tragedy, they will rush to eliminate the consequences of the accident in emergency mode. The military will be mobilized. Thousands of firefighters from all over the Soviet Union will be sent to the Chernobyl area. An emergency evacuation will be carried out for the residents of the villages near the nuclear power plant and the 50,000 strong city of Pripyat, one of the youngest cities in Ukraine. Firefighting efforts will begin, followed by the construction of a protective sarcophagus. There will also be decontamination of the radioactively contaminated area, within a 30km radius around the plant. Tens of thousands of people will take part in the liquidation of the Chernobyl disaster, saving all of humanity at the cost of their own lives and health and they will be assisted by a large amount of equipment, from ordinary trucks to specially designed machines that will operate in the extreme conditions of extremely high radiation levels. The liquidation of the consequences of the Chernobyl disaster began immediately after the accident. The first flights over the site of the tragedy shocked everyone. No one in the world had ever encountered anything like this before. It became clear that without special machines, people would not be able to fix everything. It was then, in the Chernobyl zone, that humanity first began to think about doomsday machines. You may be surprised, but before 1986, there were no special machines or robots in the world capable of working effectively in conditions of extremely high radiation levels. 
what the military had was nothing more than a radiation reconnaissance vehicle. But at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, they needed cranes, tractors, manipulators, concrete mixers, dump trucks, in short, everything required to carry out construction work. However, in the conditions of a nuclear disaster, of course, it was impossible to use regular civilian special equipment. That's why they had to convert ordinary trucks and vehicles for use in a nuclear apocalypse. Often this equipment was unique, assembled as a one-of-a-kind machine. It's simply impossible to talk about all the equipment involved in the cleanup in a single video. So in this episode we'll cover only the most interesting aspects of this topic. And don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already. Let's get started. At first only ordinary equipment was used at the site of the tragedy. There were no specially created samples with the required level of radiation protection. It was necessary to eliminate the consequences of the Chernobyl accident urgently, without wasting a single day. So the liquidators prepared the equipment as best they could, lining the trucks with lead sheets. For example, the Kamaz 55111 was used in the exclusion zone as both a concrete mixer and a dump truck. Of course, such modifications provided only weak protection against radiation, but they still had some effect. The same fate befell the T-25 tractor. When there was a shortage of compact bulldozers, it was used on the roof to deal with graphite and other debris. The cab was also lined with lead sheets to reduce radiation exposure for the driver. Later, this tractor was buried as a highly hazardous object. Even someone with no knowledge of radiation protection would understand that these measures were not sufficient. It was decided to develop special versions of standard vehicles for removing radioactive debris from the fourth power unit. A specially designed Kras 256B100300 was created for this purpose. It had an increased level of protection. Initially, it was planned to develop a lead capsule for the standard cab. But in the end, the vehicle was converted into a single-seater. To accommodate the massive filtration system and modify the design, several tons were added to the vehicle's weight. To make the driver's work easier in extreme conditions, changes had to be made to the chassis. Four batteries were installed to power the powerful air filtration system. Before the Chernobyl disaster, vehicles originally designed for combat operations such as the BRDM-2 were used. It was used in the Chernobyl zone as a reconnaissance vehicle. If the vehicle starts to get stuck, the crew can deploy four additional wheels that extend from the body. Getting stuck in a contaminated city in 1986 is not the same as getting stuck somewhere while fishing. If you get stuck with your vehicle in a contaminated area, you can quickly say goodbye to your health. All the more so because in Pripyat and on the territory of the station itself, soil was actively being removed and contaminated roads were being cut away. Helicopters were also involved. According to various sources, about 80 helicopters, MI6, MI8, MI24 and MI26 were involved in the disaster response. The decontamination of the area took place next to the 4th power unit. These helicopters sprayed a special liquid there to suppress radioactive dust. And they also dropped sand, boric acid and other materials onto the reactor. They were also used to measure radiation levels. According to satellite data, thanks to the helicopter's actions, by April 30 the radioactive plume from the destroyed reactor had practically disappeared. We cannot overlook the story of the cranes that were used during the cleanup for construction work over the fourth power unit. Three DMAC cranes were purchased in Germany. These cranes are self-propelled and, at that time, were a German innovation. Therefore, these cranes had to be assembled by German specialists. But when they found out that the assembly would take place near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, the Germans refused to do the installation and the new German cranes had to be assembled by Soviet workers. Just think about it. According to German regulations, assembling one crane takes three months, but the Soviet workers assembled three DMAX in just 26 days. It's also important to remember that the cranes weren't just being assembled in an open field, but under conditions of high radiation levels. And we shouldn't overlook the fact that the Germans reluctantly provided our team with an incomplete set of blueprints in order to keep their secrets. Besides helicopters, one very rare aerial vehicle also took part in the cleanup. The thing is, construction work on the sarcophagus continued even at night. The same DMAC cranes were used in the construction. They had to be operated from a safe distance. To control these cranes, television equipment was installed on them. But as evening fell, the cameras would go blind. The construction site needed to be illuminated. And that's where a problem arose. But where could the floodlights be installed? The buildings closest to the reactor were up to 40 meters tall, while the reactor itself was 70 meters high. Accordingly, it was impossible to illuminate such a site from the nearest buildings. 
an airplane or helicopter was not suitable for this purpose because their time over the site was limited. However, a tethered aerostat was ideal for this task in every respect. The aerostat could remain at the required altitude for almost unlimited periods and radiation had no effect on it. A 40 kilowatt spotlight was installed on it. What happened to the aerostat afterwards? Of course, this is a burial. A very rare, unique, specialized machine was delivered to the area of the destroyed reactor on May 3, 1986. For this, a special flight from Leningrad to Kyiv was even organized. From the airport, the special equipment made its way under its own power to the city of Chernobyl, and then onto the industrial site of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This machine, which was entrusted with great hopes, was supposed to provide reliable protection for personnel conducting radiation reconnaissance in the immediate vicinity of the destroyed reactor. This machine was called the highly protected transport vehicle Ladoga. It was the only vehicle in the zone that was designed from scratch specifically for operations in the conditions of nuclear war, the only vehicle that could approach the destroyed unit up close. Robots also made a very important contribution during the cleanup. The high radiation levels at the construction site did not allow workers and builders to stay there for long. It was decided to use remote controlled equipment. An example of such equipment is the remote controlled bulldozer of the Japanese brand Komatsu. The main task was to clear the construction sites of radioactive soil. Since the range of the remote control was limited, this equipment was operated from the cabin of military armored vehicles. The remains of this bulldozer are still located on the territory of the Jupiter plant. Perhaps the most popular among all the other liquidators was the specialized transport robot STR-1. It is this device that can be seen in archival footage during the cleanup of radioactive debris. Dozens of scientific institutes participated in the development of this machine, and its design was based on the self-propelled chassis of a lunar rover. Scientists spent three and a half months manufacturing this unique machine. The STR-1 was operated remotely and powered by two silver zinc batteries. The machine was delivered to the roof of the power unit by a MI-8 helicopter. It's surprising that the creators of the 2019 British series Chernobyl overlooked the STR-1, with the machine only briefly mentioned by academician Valery Legasov. The use of this machine helped preserve the health of nearly a thousand people. That is how many soldiers would have been needed to do all of its work. German equipment was generally unlucky in the Chernobyl zone. For example, this German police robot MM2, nicknamed Joker by the liquidators, was equipped to work on the roof of the third power unit. It was made in 1972 but never managed to prove itself. The Soviet side, when ordering the Joker for themselves, lowered the radiation level and the robot, which was poorly shielded by the Germans, broke down. The mobile robot Chernobyl, a simple machine, managed to clear almost 11,000 square meters of area from radioactive debris. The experience gained from using the model led to the creation of an entire bureau dedicated to the development of emergency robotics TA and its various modifications. There were also homemade robots. For example, the Biloyaris robot was a makeshift device built using an aircraft boarding ramp as its base. This machine was assembled by employees of the Bilovarskaya nuclear power plant who participated in the cleanup and needed their own equipment. There are also several interesting examples from military equipment. Many will be surprised to learn that self-propelled artillery units, ISU-152, were used during the cleanup. This is equipment from World War II. Unfortunately, there is still no reliable information about how the ISU-152 was used during the disaster cleanup. All that is known is that about a dozen of these vehicles were brought into the exclusion zone not to fire at the destroyed fourth reactor unit. But apparently this idea was later abandoned. However, there is a photo showing an ISU-152 being used to demolish a building in the industrial area of the plant. We also can't overlook the Chernobyl shuttle bus, the BTR-70. It ran along the dirtiest route, taking workers away from the reactor and bringing the new shift to the block. The engineering clearance vehicle was one of the main workhorses of the zone. Its mayor not only collected hazardous fuel and graphite and loaded them onto trucks. The Imers leveled villages to the ground and destroyed equipment before burying it in landfills. Of course, they were used not only as means for bearing the consequences of the accident, but also for hauling parts of the sarcophagus and serving as tractors. There were also two Bella's water trucks. It was planned to use these machines in Pripyat itself, where they were supposed to wash the windows and walls of high-rise buildings. 
However, the pumps were too powerful and would break the windows. Therefore, the Bellas trucks were used to wash roads and other buildings without windows. The army Zill tanker turned out to be much easier to use. The truck's cab was lined with lead screens. Many different zeals and urals in the form of fire trucks were used to wash buildings. According to some liquidators, such watering trucks could still be found in working condition in various parts of the zone, even a year after the accident. People from the surrounding villages were evacuated by regular buses, such as the Paz 672. But completely different vehicles were sent into the nuclear inferno. Specially prepared buses operated in Chernobyl. First and foremost, these were LAZ-695 buses with windows covered by lead curtains. There were also more compact Tajikistan 3205 buses, a nicknamed Lead Bus. The echoes of the Chernobyl disaster cleanup can still be found everywhere you go once you pass beyond the barbed wire. For 39 years now, robots, vehicles and other transport used by the liquidators have remained frozen in the dense forests of the Chernobyl zone. However, the high radiation levels did not protect it from looting. For various reasons, the number of surviving specimens decreases every year, 